Funding for Frontline is provided by the Park Foundation, committed to raising public awareness. With major funding for News War from the Richard and Rhoda Goldman Foundation. And additional funding from the Nathan Cummings Foundation. Frontline is made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Tonight on Frontline... The job of a reporter is to be the curmudgeon who raises questions that nobody else wants to raise. That's what the best reporters try to do. Once upon a time, they were thought of as heroes. But today, the entire news industry is in crisis. The public has a terrific disdain for the press. We have a press that is at war with an administration while our country is at war against merciless enemies. For 30 or more years there's been an assumption about the government and the press and suddenly in the last couple of years that's changed. In a four-part special series, frontline reporter Lowell Bergman looks at the challenges facing journalists today. Would you go to jail to protect your sources? Absolutely. The war between the White House and the press. The President of the United States saying, if you publish this story, you will have blood on your hands. The explosion of new and emerging media. Do I ever feel like the 6 o'clock news just ain't cutting it for you? You don't see anybody between 20 and 30 getting their news from the evening news. You see them getting it online. And the economic realities of today's news business. You have to make more every year to keep the shareholders happy. How did we get here? We're judging journalism by the same standards that we apply to entertainment. That may be one of the greatest tragedies in the history of American journalism. And what is at stake? There's a dire need for institutions that tell the truth, that pursue the truth, and that chase it at all costs. Tonight, part one of News War, our Frontline special series. July 6, 2005, outside the D.C. Federal District Court, a media swarm gathered. They were hounding fellow journalists. How important do you feel about First Amendment rights to press? Reporters who were refusing to testify in the investigation known as the Plame Affair. Do you have any comment at all? Sorry. A case that had become the most significant clash between the press and federal government in decades. What do we want? Free press! When do we want it? Now! This case did damage, I think, to the First Amendment. I think it did damage to the individual careers of a number of reporters. I think it did damage to the credibility of the media. There was no more tangled business between the Bush administration and the press than the Plame Affair. The conflict that would raise profound questions about reporters' ability to protect their confidential sources has its roots in the administration's march to war. Mr. Speaker, the President of the United States. In January of 2003, the Bush administration was riding high in Afghanistan, America had toppled the Taliban. And now the president was preparing the country for a new war. A brutal dictator with a history of reckless aggression, with ties to terrorism, with great potential wealth, will not be permitted to dominate a vital region and threaten the United States. They were feeling a kind of confidence they had a kind of hubris. If you had to look at a few months in this administration as to maybe the perils of, of overconfidence, you probably would look at these few months. Saddam has perfected the game of cheat and retreat and is very skilled in the art of denial and deception. For several months, there had been a steady drumbeat to war. What he wants is time and more time to husband his resources, to invest in his ongoing chemical and biological weapons program, and to gain possession of nuclear weapons. There was clearly a set pattern of speeches 
two or three times a day to reinforce the WMD thing. Walter Pincus is a longtime national security reporter for the Washington Post. First it was nuclear, and then it was the idea that they had chemical and biological. As we meet, chemists and biologists and nuclear scientists are toiling in weapons labs and underground bunkers, working to give the world's most dangerous dictators weapons of unprecedented power and lethality. Then it was the idea that they would give it, give it to the terrorists. The man is a threat, Hutch, I'm telling you. I, uh, I, he's a threat not only with what he has, he's a threat with what he's done. He's a threat because he is dealing with Al-Qaeda. Just overwhelming the advantage the government has when it wants to sell a point of view, and that's what they did. But the Bush administration was also helped by the nation's leading newspapers. It's important to understand that the number of news organizations that actually have a national security reporter or bureaus overseas and can penetrate the intelligence community are very limited. And the New York Times is at the top of that list. So when the New York Times began to have stories that supported the administration's claims about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, it had an echo effect. It had an echo effect that the administration was conscious of and employed. What specifically has he obtained? We now know that you had people talking to key reporters doing these stories for the Times. There's a story in the New York Times this morning. Um, this is, uh, I don't, and I want to attribute to the Times, I don't want to talk about... Those stories would appear and then they would reference the very material that they'd given them and say, see, the, this is coming from the New York Times, not just us. Um, the kinds of tubes that are necessary to build a centrifuge, and the centrifuge is required to take low-grade uranium and, and enhance it into highly enriched uranium. It was a kind of a loop, and it was a conscious loop. A lot of people wrote, uh, uh, you know, stories that were, I think, overly credulous. Let's start with Tom, because you have one of the most riveting... Bill Keller took over as executive editor of the New York Times after the run-up to the Iraq War. It wasn't some kind of sense of overdeveloped patriotism or uh, an eagerness on the part of reporters to ingratiate themselves with the White House. What it was was, you know, reporters want to get on the front page. They want scoops. It's a very hard area to write about um, I was not alone. Many other papers made the, uh, did the same kind of reporting that I did. I think because the New York Times is the paper that it is, and I had written for so long about it, uh, I was... Uh, you were the leader. You were the expert in this area. I was the uh, alleged expert. Wow. There were other experts. Judith Miller was one of the Times' lead reporters on the WMD story. She had covered terrorism for over a decade. You've said that you may have gotten some of the stories wrong because your sources were wrong. Right. They gave me information that I believe they believed. Uh, it was information that was given to the president. The national intelligence estimate went to the president. Well, if the president was being given this information, it, it was the uh, official uh, intelligence assessment of the United States government and the intelligence community. Uh, I think I believed that, that they wouldn't give the president false information. She had the wrong sources, and you can't, the excuse can't be, I'm only as good as my sources. Now, if you have, if you've talked to everyone and exhausted uh, every possible avenue, then you can say that, but no reporter ever does that. So uh, if, if your sources are wrong, you're wrong, and you have to accept responsibility. You believed there was WMD in Iraq? I did. You said as much publicly, right? Yes. What happens if we go to war against Iraq and we get to knock them right out and we find no weapons of mass destruction? Uh, I think the chance of that happening is uh, about zero. Uh, there's just too much there. When I say the, the chances are about zero, the that's the way it looked. It was totally right. wrong. Really interesting. I think I dropped the ball here. I should have pushed much, much harder. Harder on the skepticism about the reality of WMD. Yes. It, it, uh, other words, uh, 
said, hey, look, the evidence is not as strong as they are claiming. No terrorist state poses a greater or more immediate threat to the security of our people than the regime of Saddam Hussein in Iraq. A al-Qaeda-type network trained and armed by Saddam could attack America and leave not one fingerprint. We have first-hand descriptions of biological weapons factories on wheels. We don't want the smoking gun to be a mushroom cloud. Many in the media got the WMD story wrong. The one part of the bill of particulars against Saddam... That Frontline aired security its own report on the possible threats of Saddam's weapons programs. When a man known as Saddam's bombshaker went to work. The way that the press was sold and spun and turned around and just fooled by the White House in the run-up to the war represents more than just a missed story. How can one say that we have a watchdog press after a performance like that? In fact, there was some WMD reporting that did get the story right. What we were doing was following reporting, and good solid reporting was telling us one thing, and that's what we wrote. Clark Hoyt was Knight Ritter's Washington editor during the run-up to the war in Iraq. What we were hearing from very good sources was really nothing has changed with Iraq. But as they continued their skeptical reporting, Hoyt says they began to feel heat from the government. Someone in the Defense Department called our reporter a communistic Bolshevik. Others uh, said, uh, you know, all you guys have in this town is your reputation and your credibility and we're going to get you. We're going to get that. I will say at times it seemed very lonely because you kept looking around saying, where's everybody else? The Washington Post had reporters who had also begun hearing doubts about the evidence of WMD in the final days before war. I started calling people I knew in the Pentagon and finally got somebody who just honestly said, we don't know where they are. We don't know if they are there. And then somebody in the agency did the Potemkin village idea that Saddam Hussein was making believe he had the stuff when he didn't. That led up to the peace two days before the war that, that it might not be there. Pincus's story ran on page 13. The lead headline of the post that day was, President tells Hussein to leave Iraq within 48 hours or face invasion. By the beginning of May 2003, Baghdad had fallen. Major combat operations in Iraq have ended. In the Battle of Iraq, the United States and our allies have prevailed. The president landed aboard the USS Lincoln. Operation Iraqi Freedom was carried out with a combination of precision and speed and boldness the enemy did not expect and the world had not seen before. 